With us in studio today, Switina Mboko. Dr. Mboko is a professor in the Seidman College of Business at Grand Valley State University. She joins us to talk about her personal immigration story and her current research in the area of refugee entrepreneurship. Switina, welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Thank you. Now, you're originally from the country of Zimbabwe. Yes. Zimbabwe has <clears throat> lots of um, higher education. There's a big university in Harare. Yet you're teaching in the United States. What made you come here? Well, in the field of research, we travel. So, you know, scholarship brought me to the United States. I was actually a professor at the University of Zimbabwe when I visited the U.S. as a scholar. And what, was, what year was that? I came to the United States in 2007. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where, where, were you, where were you doing your research as a scholar? I was, I was in Minnesota, St. Cloud State. St. Cloud State, okay, mm -hmm. great. Central Minnesota, mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to stay? Well, I just saw opportunities to stay and continue developing as a scholar, but I still keep going back home every year. I go home, I'm doing research both in the United States and in Zimbabwe. Okay, so how, uh, you, you go back every year, the majority of your family is still in Zimbabwe? Yes, my family is still in Zimbabwe. My children, are, some of them are here in the United States, but my family is still in Zimbabwe. So what keeps some of your kids here? They went to school here and they are now working here. Okay, mm -hmm. so American uh, high school education, college education, where do they fit? Because obviously kids are different ages. Yeah, in, um, in my home country, we do have high school education. And when they graduate from high school, they can come into college in the United States. So they all left after high school and came to study here. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the majority language in Zimbabwe is Shona, and this mm -hmm. is your first, your first language. Yes. So when you're with, alone with your kids, what language do you speak? We speak Shona. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful. So when they go outside, they can switch comfortably. So do you think your kids feel equally bilingual, bi bicultural in navigating those spaces? I think they do. I think they do. I actually think my children are more acclimated to the two cultures than me because they were younger when they came in. I was already settled in my profession and I came here. So I see big contrasts. I'm not sure about them. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think for somebody who spent the, a good portion of their early life th there in the home country, you really feel the need for that ongoing connection. Like, I, yeah, let me get back home. Let me check with family. Let me sort of reimmerse myself in, in where I'm comfortable. I'm not sure it's a question of comfort. You know, when you have lived in an area, I, I was born in Zimbabwe, grew up there, came to the United States as a professor. I, I remember clearly my formative years, but coming to the U.S. already somebody established in their field, it was easy for me to adapt professionally. Sure. So when I go back to Zimbabwe, it's not so much about my work in the United States. It's just retaining, you know, family rules. And I feel comfortable when I get home because I know that's, I mean, I don't need an explanation of what, the, what this word means and so on. I'm just Comfortable. And the operating system, the cultural <coughs> operating system, you know it because you learn yeah. it. Yeah. When you go back, do family members comment, oh, you, you're starting to develop an accent or, oh, you're behaving a little American? Do you get those kinds of observations? No. Okay. So they actually are surprised because at one time my sister-in-law said to me, you haven't changed a little bit. So... I don't know. I, I don't speak in English when I go back home. No need. Mm, maybe where I'm a little different is in terms of performance outcomes and expectation for delivery. I think that's where we have a little bit of friction because culturally we are operating in two different worlds. Talk more about that, please. 
if I was in Zimbabwe, for example, and I made an appointment with someone, I'm coming to, I'm coming to see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock. If something stops me from going to that meeting, I will not go. And I will inform them later that I couldn't come for this reason. But in this environment, you, it's the other way. Once you know you can't make a meeting, you inform the other person that I can't make a meeting. So when I try to talk to people at home and ask for results and ask why something was not done and so on, there sometimes can be some friction. Not because one is more right than the other, it's just differences in the way we, you know. Different we, operating mm, system, mm, mm, absolutely. Mm. So when you first came to Minnesota, what were some of your more difficult adjustments of being here 24-7 in North American culture? Uh, other than the weather. <laughs> Minnesota weather? weather? <laughs> yeah, other than it's Minnesota weather. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think the most striking difference is uh, how days in America Th that's my perception. They are completely full. It's like you get up, you go to work, you have your lunch or whatever, you come back. It's, it's not like you can say, oh, so what am I doing today? It's like it's packed and it's normal. People accounting for every spare moment mm -hmm. in, in U.S. culture because, well, after all, Americans say time is money. So with that time is money, that's the question I continuously had. W nobody has a longer day. 24 hours. So when we, when we are operating at home, I know we have work days, we have weekends and so on, but we, s we seem to have slightly more time on our hands. So that is what struck me, that the American day seems to be shorter than our day, time-wise, in terms of the number of hours in a day. Does it seem more stressful living in the U.S. than when you're back in Zimbabwe? Yes. It's more stressful, but, you know, as an individual, you need to study your context and do what you need to do to be productive in that context. So I have learned over the years that trying to continuously contrast takes you away from what you're supposed to be doing. Those differences are there. Sure. No environment is better than the other. They are just different environments. So I've just learned how to be productive in the U.S. economy. I like to tell American students who have the good fortune of having an international professor uh, in their classes is a real gift because it's giving them a window on the world. Because once they graduate, they go into the world of work, they're mm -hmm. certainly going to have either coworkers or bosses or customers who mm -hmm. are not from the US. Mm -hmm. And that they really need to take advantage of that gift early on in, in their undergraduate education. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things do you notice in those conversations with your American students? Initially, when we start classes, it's the typical, that's what I noticed actually when I came to the United States, that, and that is what kept me going, that the classroom environment is very similar. It's high, we are teaching in college, and content-wise is the same, is the approach that might differ, which I could talk about a little bit more. But with my students, it takes them time. One thing I noticed is I didn't know what an accent meant. <laughs> but if they say the professor speaks with an accent, I don't know. So initially, I think they are young kids and they are, they are still experimenting. And many of them have not left the region before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they think their way of speaking mm -hmm. is, is a universal. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that the first few lectures, they are sort of apprehensive, mm. but with time, you know, they eventually reach out and we talk about, and I, I ask them, I give them an opportunity to ask about me, to ask about my background and so on. And that really, you know, eventually breaks possibly some barrier between mm -hmm. us. But 
<coughs> it, it takes some time. You, you need to reach out to the students sure. and make them feel comfortable to reach out to you and talk about your personal life. And so in fact, they don't know it, but when they're signing up for your class, they're really double dipping because yes, they're getting, they're getting content, but they're also getting exposure to mm -hmm. you know, essentially a world that they really even couldn't mm -hmm. imagine mm -hmm. before. I want to switch now because we want to, before we um, uh, go further, I want to talk about this interesting research project that you took on um, this, this past year. You were working with uh, refugee entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that study? Yeah, first of all, I, I think I want to explain why I got interested in this study. When I came to America, I, I had not really spent time thinking about what it means to be an immigrant. And in my home country, we hardly talk about immigrants. So that word kept coming up to me. And I'm, an, I'm a researcher in entrepreneurship. So I said, how can I investigate this phenomenon called immigration or, you know, and still be relevant to my discipline? So refugee entrepreneurship was an area of interest for me. So I just wanted to understand whether being an immigrant influences the entrepreneurship process. Because I mean, for my research, I I'm comfortable discussing entrepreneurial characteristics, why people go into business, the strategies that they use, and so on. So I just wanted to see whether if you're an immigrant, that process would be different. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got interested in studying Edo and refugees. This, this study that you uh, embarked on this year uh, was a qualitative study, not yes. a quantitative study, mm -hmm. which allows you to actually create a certain rapport with, uh, with the uh, smaller number of, of people that you interviewed. Mm -hmm. Do you sense that because of your background uh, as both a professor of entrepreneurship and as, as an immigrant yourself, that they, they felt more comfortable talking with you? Well, I can confirm that I did not have any problems reaching out okay. and you know getting responses, whether if they had been speaking to somebody else, the responses would have been different. I, I can't talk to that. Okay. But what I do know is from my qualitative study, I ask a lot of questions that are to do with explaining what is happening. So in addition to knowing they are in business, I could reach out to them to say, why did you choose to go into business? How do you understand your operating environment? Because obviously having come here, as refugees, they, and the people that I interviewed were already adults when they left their home countries. So when they talk about the business environment, they have two business environments that they are talking about. Sure. They, are all, they also have two macro environments that they are talking about, their home environment and their local environment. And it was really interesting to see how they contrast the environments and, you know, how their perception of the environment influences how they formulate strategy. What was maybe uh, one of the major findings from your, from your research? That entrepreneurship is the same. If you are going to be an entrepreneur, you need to be clear of what you want to do. You need to be visionary. You need to navigate the business environment to a point where you get the results that you were expecting to get. So I, I really was fascinated to get confirmation that entrepreneurship theory is really sound theory, whether you are studying locals, immigrants, women, men, and so on. Because in my previous study, in my previous studies, I focused on women entrepreneurs. Again, I try to focus on marginalized or special groups so that I see whether we need to rewrite that theory to say, well, we are talking about entrepreneurship as it applies to women, or we talk about entrepreneurship as it applies to immigrants and so on. But you know, it's entrepreneurship. And I was really fascinated to make that discovery. Because, because after hearing about refugees here, you can get to a point where you miss the person aspect of the individual. 
and they are talking about refugees, we are talking about this, but these are entrepreneurs. They happen to be refugees, but they are entrepreneurs that know what they are doing, they are hardworking, they navigate the environment, they know what they want to achieve, and you know, so that was gratifying to me. And to make that contribution to the body of literature, I mean, I feel proud. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, time has absolutely flown by, but I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your, your story with us, your research. We'll look forward to actually reading this paper uh, uh, as soon as it's published. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. You bet. And thank you for joining us. If you're watching on TV, stay tuned for our following segments on information and culture. If you're watching on the internet, we hope you'll view our other conversations with the impressive immigrants who contribute their intellect to making these United States a more dynamic place. Scape, Los Scape. Angeles area. All right, so then we talked about the journey from India to the United States.